Well, it's great to welcome you back to our next Deeper Into the Word session. And it's fantastic tonight to have Graham Daniels. Graham is the director of Christians in Sport, and he's been a great friend to Hampton Road Baptist for many, many years. It's really exciting to have him tonight. He's got a great passion to reach boys and girls and men and women in the world of sport. And indeed, many, many people who are lost and without the hope of Jesus. So it's a great delight to have Keith interviewing Graham this evening. Well, we're delighted to be joined by Graham Daniels, or Dano this evening. Dano, it's great to have you. Uh, you're a very happy Graham Daniels, Wales, Rugby, just triple trying champions, Cambridge, top of League Two. Uh, how's life going, Dana? <laughs> well, as long as we keep playing teams uh, where they have 14 players, uh, or the referee makes mistakes, we'll keep going that way. The worst boys, I think, with Cambridge, uh, you, we people may be watching this in a week or two's time, so <laughs> let's see what happens. But you're right, what they say in football markers or what they say in sport really uh, is that the, the lows are much lower than the highs are higher. And I'm afraid that's true. And inevitably with sport, there's a lot more lows than highs. So when they do come along, oh my gosh, you might as well milk them for all they're worth. So I am. Absolutely. And Dano, throughout your career and throughout your life, you, you have experienced many highs and lows. Um, but tell us when you came to faith. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about Christ. Um, when did you realize the connection between Christ and your life? And tell us a little bit about that. Well, in the most, humanly speaking, the very, very simplest way. I'm 58 years of age. So I grew up in Wales in the 60s and 70s. So chapel, Welsh-speaking chapel culture, uh, all going to chapel. Mum definitely is a young, when I was a younger boy, very keen Christian. My dad was converted later, though he was church going all our lives. Um, tipping point, I, I'll keep it brief, Marcus, and you can press me from there, really. I, I'll just give you the first tipping point that, that really made a difference. When I was about 15, uh, um, I thought till providence clearly at 5 to 12 on a lovely sunny monday in may uh, in my grammar school uh, there was a knock on my uh, geography class door and it was the captain of cricket asking me if i would asking the teacher if i could go and play for the first team so of course i'm now thinking what a brilliant player i am to be 15 and in the upper sixth team but the long and the short of it was uh, somebody dropped out five minutes before the bus went I was the easiest boy to go and get his kit. So I was taken. The upshot of that trip on the Monday afternoon to Cardiff, a 50 mile trip for a 15 year old boy out of his depth uh, with one teacher and 11 boys, was that the, the captain very kindly sat by me on the way up, sat by me on the way back, because I didn't know anybody. Um, and he opened a conversation with me where he said, uh, what did I do at the weekend? So in Wales in 1970 something, you played cricket on Saturday all day. And on Sunday, you did nothing. If you didn't go to chapel and at 15, I didn't want to go. So I didn't go. So trying to reciprocate, I said to him, uh, what did you do at the weekend? And he said, oh, I played cricket Saturday, which I expected. He said, I went to church Sunday. But he was 18, you know, with legally a beard and everything. And uh, so I said to him, it came out of my mouth a bit too quick. I said, you went to chapel? Does your mother still make you go to chapel? And he said, and these are the words that have stuck with me, I was 15, forever, really. And it's behind Christians in sport, really, in my opinion, from my perspective anyway. He said to me, no, I went to church because I followed Jesus, because I followed Jesus. That's what he said. Now, I said to myself, oh, my gosh, 45 miles to get home. I'm sitting next to a Bible basher. That changed my life. I, I mean, I met somebody for the first time in my whole life. I met somebody who was shy but unashamedly christian shy mind about you know he, he, st he struggled to get it out what he wanted to say but he was willing to say something about jesus and he was a really good sportsman and for the first time in my life i thought my gosh i thought you'd be like ancient like my mother 40 or something to be a christian uh, 
but there it was changed my life that there's more to the story of course over a number of years I got converted in my 20s but that moment God used as the definitive breakthrough to give me a new optics a new set of lenses on what God was like yeah and it's amazing to think the impact that one boy can yeah. have and Guyon Jenkins that I've heard you talk about and you know, some of us are actually questioned, is he actually real? Um, yet, you know, largely unheard of, but the impact he's had in your life or God's used him in you to then impact lots of others is something for us all to think about in our daily, trying to connect Christ to culture and Christ in the uh, coffee rooms, Christ in our homes, that the impact of our lives and somebody else can be colossal. Well, well, Marcus, perhaps I'll, I'll just add to that because I, I think you, you say something very profound there. And actually, for me, it may seem unsophisticated to say, I think 80% of the way a Christian relates to culture, for what it's worth, from my point of view, was captured in that Weon Jenkins story. Because the one piece I didn't tell, which I can be succinct about, is that some years later when I was converted, in my early 20s, uh, he told me that he went home that night from the game and his mum and dad were Christians. His dad was a pastor. And, and his parents said, how did the game go? And he'd obviously, as ever, scored loads of runs and taken loads of wickets. And he said it was fine. And they were surprised that he was a bit fed up. Looked, his body language wasn't great. And his dad said, what's the matter? If he scored runs and took wickets and you won, what's the problem? He said, well, he said, I, I've never told anybody I'm a Christian before at school. And I decided last week sorry, I decided on Sunday after church that I was going to dare to say something about being a Christian this week. Uh, and I tried to tell the boy on the bus who we picked up because we were short. Uh, and I really blew it. But something useless stumbled out of my mouth, like I follow Jesus. And I really blew it. So for me, that's the profound part of that story that uh, so many of us think I'm so inept at talking about my faith to anybody in any place other than church. I'm a shambles at it. How could I ever do that? Well, there wasn't probably there was probably the worst effort at evangelism ever tried by that boy on the bus. But the Holy Spirit uses people's testimony and, and courage and vulnerability. So, yeah, it's it's really dominated my. I, I know we might talk about this, but it, it's been pretty much the bedrock of my approach to integrating Christ in the sports culture, something that simple. I feel that if we just ended our conversation here, that that would be great. And let's just go out and practice. Um, but we do want to delve into a few other things, Dano. Um, if you could sum up lockdown in three words, Dano, how would you do it? Home. Home except Saturdays. <laughs> the nature of, of the job uh, that I've had for many years, uh, I'm based at a church called Stag or St. Andrew the Great in Cambridge. Uh, so I've been associate staff there for 20 odd years. But my day job is Christians in sport. And so inevitably that job's meant traveling. So being at home every single day and every single night is unprecedented. I've never done it in my adult life. Uh, but Saturdays, until about six weeks ago, uh, because I work at the, well, I don't, I'm not paid to work at the football club. I'm non-executive. I'm a director at Cambridge United. But I've been going to all the football matches. So I watched home and away games until the second lockdown in England, when the Football Association or the English Football League said, directors, if they did go to games now, if they drove to a game in their car, and players go separately on the bus because of the testing and so on. Um, if they were stopped by police, the, the EFL, English Football League, would, would say they don't need to go to the game. So about uh, six or eight weeks ago, whatever it was, uh, Saturday also became a lockdown day. So that's how it's been. Uh, lock, staying at home, in my house. That's what it's like. And we're somebody as precarious as you, Dano, and seemingly... An extrovert. I'm sure you find that difficult. I'm well, sure that you're uh, Marcus, not that difficult. I, I, I think lots of people who who have a 
job, perhaps like yours or mine anyway. It doesn't have to be in Christian leadership. It can be in anything where you have to be up front uh, in any kind of management. The truth is, uh, I'm really an introvert. I get all my energy from being on my own. So there are parts of this. I mean, having no time with people for all of us, I think, is too much. Um, but going back to normal will be a challenge, I think, for me, because the time where I gain energy by being on my own is, is a huge factor in life. Um, and it, there's been long times in the lockdown where I've actually enjoyed it. So it's a, it's, it's, sorry, that's a bit subjective, but I'm, I'm fascinated by how I'm gonna feel when, when life becomes what, as normal as it used to be once. Yeah, no, I think that's very helpful, Dano. And I think even just realizing the roller coaster that we've been on to now and even what's ahead is going to bring many challenges and we do want to apply Christ to our own lives uh, through that. But can we rewind about 20 years, Dano? I was a fresh-faced teenager and um, I signed up to go on a weekend away with my Queen's University Christians in Sport group. Um, and a pretty old looking Graham Daniels walked in the room. I think he actually looked younger now than he did then, Dano. Um, Alex Harris, up there too. That weekend blew my mind, Dano, um, as you came over to seek to launch Christians in Sport in Northern Ireland to help us think through applying Christ uh, to our worlds of sport. Um, and for 20 years, I've been on a journey of trying to do that and find Christians in sport ever so helpful. Um, but why should we try to connect Christ and the world of sport, the culture of sport? Why don't we just leave them totally separate? Well, I think the, uh, there's, a, there's a universal dynamic to the answer, really. Uh, um, and I, let, let me just offer it to you. I think the creation mandate uh, uh, is, a, is a beautiful one, that God made us in his image uh, in the first two chapters of Genesis, articulated a number of times. Humanity is made in the image of God. And of course, there's significant debate and discussion about the nuances of what it is to be in his image. But I think I'd want to hold at the very least, at the very least, there, there may be more things than this, but at the very least, we're made creative, we're made to cultivate the earth and keep it. We're innately creative because God is a creator and we're made in his image. And he's a Trinitarian God, let us make humanity in our own image. He's relational. So the starting point for me in the relationship between culture or sport and culture is the sheer creation, the simplicity of the creation mandate that says, well, I've made you to be creative and relational. And I've given you a range of talents. We know the New Testament is replete uh, with lists of talents that overlap. So I think it's as straightforward, Mark, as saying, well, you work out your salvation in, in, the, in the context of life that you're in. And so if you live in the 21st century, sport is one of those things that is accessible to the vast majority of the population. And for some of us, the way that we love to engage in being creative is to build relationships with people around the creativity of running, jumping, kicking, and all that. So let me just stop there. I, I think that's the fundamental thing. So if you are musical, artistic, intellectual, I mean, there are a range of aspects of the creation mandate. Sport is no more significant than any of them as we have created those activities, nor is it less. It's just part of that mandate where Christians can exercise their talent in relationship with others. That's very helpful, Dan. And what I loved, I always thought Christians in sport was getting a professional down to the church to give a talk. Mm -hmm. But what I loved was you guys helping me as a below average rugby player uh, to seek to do that for God's glory and to 
Um, but tell us then, through a creation mandate, is that why should we, but how do we do that? Um, how do we connect Christ to our world of sport? Is it just that we can talk to friends about Jesus or is it more of a simplified way of doing that too? Yeah, I, th I think there is. And, and again, I think that if I may call it a template or, or a framework or a set of lenses, whatever picture we use for this, we know the creation's broken. We know sin comes into the world. We know the story of Genesis 3. And it's very clear in the biblical narrative that the image of God is fractured, not destroyed, but fractured in humanity. Uh, and we want to be in charge of the world ourselves. And, and the third chapter of Genesis very clearly outlines the breakdown uh, in the effects of our talents. Creation is broken, the garden is full of thorns and thistles. Uh, and the relationship between Adam and Eve is fractured. So clearly, the, the picture represents that anything that human beings touch now is broken. That, that means it, it can work well periodically, but it also goes bad. Uh, and so in sport, of course, the way you said about using your ability to run, jump, kick and all that in relationship to teammates, referees and opponents shows that fracture all the time. Sport is a, is a, a fractured vessel, as is teaching and banking and accountancy and arts and music and drama and everything's broken so to use that as a segue Marcus, to to offer a positive response in the light of that fracture i think the new testament mandate is that when you come to new life through christ when you enter into a relationship where your identity is realigned it can't be fixed until the lord comes again but when the Holy Spirit comes into the life of a woman or a man because of the life and death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, when we repent and turn to Christ, in Lloyd Martin Lloyd-Jones language, the great Welsh preacher of the 20th century, we look up and we see that actually the image of God through Jesus Christ will be restored in me and the work will begin right now. He'll start to mend the fracture in me. And the consequences of looking up is looking out. And then we look at the places where God has given us a vocation, our mum and dad, our, our wife or husband, our children, our best friends, our neighbours, our workmates, our people at our own church, at our sports club, in the drama club. We look around and we say, Lord, I'm made by you. I believe in Christ the image of Christ is being restored in me. Give me the strength now by the power of the Spirit to behave in ways which bring dignity in my vocation in the world around me. And therefore, if a woman or a man finds a big chunk of their lives is invested in playing and training sport, that's the school of discipleship. Uh, and perhaps I'll throw one more thing in, though it makes the answer a bit long. I think I'd want to add to that for your reflection, Marcus, that the place where we learn the most about following Jesus, where we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, as the Apostle Paul says, is in the places where previously our biggest idols were. Uh, so if sport has been your idol, if it defined who you were, if it made you angry when you lost and spiteful to people and so on, the Holy Spirit getting to work in there is probably the greatest place to begin to make you a member of the school of discipleship. Because if you can change, if he can change you there, he can change you everywhere. And that's why for me, sport works as a marvelous school of being a disciple of Jesus. Yeah, that, that's a real helpful point about working our salvation where our idols were the biggest. And it's nearly not in the church gathering where we work at our, our salvation it's not listening to another sermon it's it's when the rubber hits the road when we get as angry as we ever do or as happy even as we ever do about a disoriented happiness yeah, yeah well I, I, 
we've chosen silly names for things when we pull Christians and sport people together, because as you know, Marcus, the local church, in the opinion of a parachurch organization like ours, is the most fundamental place where we all ought to be trained for the Christian life, not a parachurch work. And it's a place where evangelism should happen as well as encouragement and people can always come in. I know that's Hamilton Road at work. Um, but but, but I, I think this becomes quite important. So, so, so if we've ever pulled Christians and people, sports people together, uh, we, call, we call that gathering the clubhouse because it's often in the clubhouse that the coach does the tactics, but the tactics are meant for when you leave the clubhouse to go onto the field. And I think your point is really important. Meeting together under the sound of God's word is a place where there's encouragement and evangelism, but it sets us up to go and be priests to work out our discipleship in 24-7 life. So I think that's a really important point. Church is there to set us up to go, but we work out our worship in the places where our idols are the greatest by the power of the spirit through the teaching of the word which is why christians in sport people must be first and foremost local church people they must be before they're sports people yeah and that's so helpful and um, we are so thankful for christians in sport seeking just to help and encourage the local church and the as I re reflect on the number of people that you have trained, that you, you've had on your team, that you've then sent to local churches, to then pastor or children's workers, youth workers, and vice versa. It's a wonderful combination that I know that we've really benefited from here at Hamilton Road. And just up that point of thing, there is something for us all to work through in these days coming out of lockdown as a church regathers again physically bodily as it's commanded to how do we seek to train ourselves for this new world and how do we then go um and that's a long conversation not for the day but um just thinking about lockdown and many people taking the illustration from the world of sport have had their idols taken from them you know going to the game playing in the game whether it's professionals whether it's amateurs you know whether it's me not being able to play five as i football on tuesdays <laughs> really badly but it's been devastating for me and a group of friends what effect has this had on the individuals as you see the world of sport in Cambridge and across the UK and even across the world that you're involved in? Maybe that's it's you picked up five aside example, which I think is a good one because, of course, whether you're a Christian or not, you're creative and relational, and there's something wonderful about playing and laughing and competing, and so. The social routine of doing that uh, is a loss uh, and people have various formats of that beyond sport let, let me then give you an example of that perhaps from professional football maybe um, when the lockdown started uh, as you said Marcus we've known each other a long time and and because I was converted as a footballer in my 20s I spent really my 30s and 40s trying to share the gospel with sports people, professional footballers really around the country um, and then getting them stuck into churches when they got converted so that's been a normal part of life but if you ever got two or three players in the same place at the same time i mean that was just miraculous because they live all over the country and they're always traveling or playing or training well in the lockdown we just had a hunch and said nobody's playing at the moment last march what if we tried to get a handful of people in the same room together for an hour a week, open the Bible for 10 minutes, get them into groups, get them talking. Well, I mean, it's been, it's been incredible. Uh, it's just worked. You know, you're talking 30, I think 30-ish rugby players we know of who come to groups, 30-odd football coaches, tennis, hockey, netball. I mean, and people have stuck with it. So uh, that's been an incredible change that's come from lockdown that we've never seen in our lives because people have started talking to each other about working out their talent and relationships within the nuanced subculture of the sport they work in 
So I, I've gone slightly off piece there, but that's been an incredible gain that God has given through modern technology. One which we could never have imagined happening. You talked there, Daniel, about the change of somebody who's been a professional sports person for their entire mm -hmm. adult life and then the change to normal non-sports life. Um, you've been doing a bit of research into that area and the difference that faith can make and potentially does. What do you see as the pitfalls of for anybody who is coming out of a life of fame, success, even at any level, and not having Christ? And the, what difference do you think Christ does is making it if they do have Christ? Well, Marcus, I've gained a, a little degree of confidence in how to answer this, I think, in the last few years. Um, I was persuaded in my middle 50s to start doing some research, sort of <laughs> doctoral research on elite sports people. And of course, I knew nothing about how you do research. But what was behind it was somebody had said to me, there's pretty much nothing written at all in, in any kind of academic format about the experience of people who get converted to the Lord Jesus during their career as sports people. And it's very hard to get access to people to interview them, to get the data, to write the inquiry. So I've been in it. Uh, and it's been fascinating. Let, let me try and offer you a couple of quick observations. So I'll give you the data before the theory, really. Data-wise, uh, I've interviewed uh, 14 people three times each, all of whom were converted in professional football careers. Two things stand out in their answers. Here's the first. They find their fulfillment when they meet the Lord Jesus, and nothing rocket science about this theologically, when they meet Christ, they start to find a fulfillment in their relationship with him that they've never experienced in anything before. However, that's countercultural, because since you're a little tot being the best kid in school at football, and then the best in your town, then the best in the county, and all that, you have been taught that football is the source of satisfaction, and if you can just make it, you really will be happy. Let me stick with this one. Then the problem emerges. You get injured or managers change or you don't get a new contract or you're out of form or you're getting hammered on Twitter or you don't get picked for Northern Ireland because you've had a bad run of games in the championship. At this point, a terrible thing happens to elite sports people. Those who don't know Christ have been trained all their lives that sport will give them the fulfillment they want. And if they make it, they really will be happy. Then they become cynical because they know they're actually a piece of meat in the game and they're only as good as their capacity to perform for the manager and the team and the owner. And they become very disenfranchised from their sport. And therefore, this is what happens. They have to pretend when they go to work to keep the manager willing to pick them. Or if they leave for another club, the manager says, he's got a good professional attitude. He'll be good for you. If they don't pretend to love football more than anything at work, they want to have a good attitude. And so people have split, world, split worlds and they end up hating sport when they finish it. Because they're one thing at home and another thing they have to pretend to be the 15 year old at work. Come on, come on, we're all in this together. Come on, I love it. When somebody gets converted, they can integrate them because they start to work out that they have security as well as fulfillment because God gave them the talent and the relationships in the club. And it's God's design that they're there right now. And if it's God's design to take them out, he's in charge, not the manager. If God closes a career with injury, he's in charge, not the manager. It's not chance. And most deeply, their fulfillment is found in knowing Christ. And it becomes less, not, not nil, less tragic when you lose. And you've got more equilibrium. And as people mature in faith, that sense of fulfillment through Christ and security through God's design makes a person more capable of equilibrium in their professional career and when they have to leave it. And they all talk like that without knowing it, because I don't ask them that question directly. It's beautiful, Marcus. It's beautiful. Nothing new theologically in that, but actually getting evidence from people's answers to tell me how you navigated 
retiring with injury. Tell me what happened when you first became a Christian, when you played at Arsenal. Oh, and that comes back at you. And something happened inside me, right? And it was something I'd never got for football. And then I got dropped, you know, a new manager came, but I was gutted, but I was a bit less scared. And it was because when I was going to church, I was hearing talks about how Jesus is with you, whatever happens. And beautiful. That's a long answer, man. Sorry. That's so helpful. Now, um, possibly some of your viewers here are in the world of sport and they love it and they don't know Christ and they're possibly watching because somebody's asking them to watch it. What would you say to somebody who loves the world of sport or loves the world of music or loves the world of finance? Um, what would you say to them about thinking about Christ and thinking about examining him just a little bit more? Well, I think I'd say, given what I've just been telling you about elite football, I'd say, if I was looking at them straight in the eye, I'd say, you know, don't you? However much you love music or, or accountancy or the finances, or however much you love teaching, you do know. You've been in it long enough now to know. It can't fulfill you entirely, don't you? You do know that. Yeah, you love it, but it's a labour of love now, isn't it? it you, you sort of got to do it, and you love it sometimes, but it's a labour of love. Can I take you beyond the gifts to the giver? The one who made you good enough to do this. The one who gave you the talent. The one who gave you the relationships with the people, friends and enemies, that you work with to do it. He loves you independently of this gift. If you were the biggest failure in your career right now, his love would be unchanging. In fact, he loved you while you were his enemy. He loved you so much that he would die for you. So I would say to them, if I was you, stop looking left and right and inside. Stop looking at the joys and frustrations that you go through in your vocation. Stop for a minute and ask, look up, who gave me this and who is he? And what does he want to do with my life? Well, he wants to be my savior. Well, what does he want to do with my passion? He wants to give you stability that when it's up or down, you know you're loved so that when you look at the people in that passion with you, you can treat them with deep humanity. As somebody else made in the image of God, and they might, and I would have to finish with this, Mark, as I'd have to say to them, don't think this is just something that you get and you turn to Christ and then you crack on and he changes you in the way you work out your football. No, no, he changes you so that they can see in you the one who put you amongst them. And so that they can say to you, what did you do at the weekend? And you say, well, I played on Saturday and I went to church on Sunday. And they say, why do you go to church, Marcus? And he say, because I follow Jesus. And they say, oh my gosh, it's never occurred to me that somebody who loves the arts or music or accountancy or teaching, who loves everything I love, goes through the highs and lows that I go through, could have something so much bigger that seems to root them. Can you tell me more, please, Gwion? That's what I'd say. That's how it ends up if you become a Christian. You find something so precious that it's inevitable that it get passed on through you. That's what will happen to you. That's a great way to end the conversation today. That's taking us full circle. Dan, lots for us to think about, about possibly sharing our faith or for some who don't yet have faith in God to consider um, a greater meaning and purpose and security and acceptance in life. Dan, if somebody's seeking to find out more about connecting Christ to the culture of sport, how can they do that through Christians in sport? How can they do that through local churches or any recommendations on just on people wanting to go a bit further from here? Well, if, if it's anyone in the vicinity, because I know Hamilton Road Baptist Church very well, if it's anyone in the vicinity uh, that you're in, or oh, or who's listening for that reason, show up at yours, uh, because it's the best place to be. But I appreciate that many churches and many leaders might be listening to this conversation on Christ and culture. So um, I think I would say, if you don't know somebody who is a Christian, here's your best bet, first of all. Google Christians in sport. You'll find a range of media there. Um, 
my name's Graham, Graham Daniels. Just send us an email, write to Christians in Sport. We'll help you take the next step. We'll help with that. Uh, but be warned, we will try and find somebody and we will know somebody near you who's a trustworthy church leader. Uh, and we will help you to connect in that way. So Christians in Sport, go to Christians in Sport if you don't know anyone. Uh, go to your local church if you know somebody. Great. Well, can I say a big thank you for, for today? Uh, thank you for the past 20 years from the weekend in Port Rush to a uh, week long holiday in Lanzarote to uh, dozens or probably 17, 18 years of camps. It's been wonderful to partner as a church, as a friend, as a individual. And we do look forward to continuing uh, the conversation and the partnerships with Thank you, Graham. Thanks, Marcus. Absolute, it was an absolute privilege spending a few minutes with you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, I hope you've been encouraged and as challenged as I have been to listen to what Graham has had to share with us this evening. And as Graham has challenged us in a number of occasions tonight, just to get connected into our local church and then from that to reach out to the world all around us with the hope of Jesus. So we are looking forward to next Sunday night where we'll have Dr. Zach Eswine, where he will help us again to think through how to connect Christ to the culture and to the world that we're living in. God bless you. Thank you for listening to Deeper Into the Word. We hope and pray it has been a blessing to you. To access more teaching from Hamilton Road Baptist, please visit our Facebook page and YouTube at Hamilton Road Baptist.